Hello, everybody. Nice to see you again. I've been very much enjoying all your comments on the um, uh, you know, forums. <laughs> so um, you uh, so go back and you have to have not checked. Uh, I'm definitely uh, I've made comments, so feel free to go back check out my comments. Sorry, my brain's a little today. Um, so today I want to talk about uh, community ecology. And I'm, I've, I've had to, in, in revamping these notes from last semester to this semester, which is kind of what I've been doing, tweaking it here and there so it matches your book better. I'm going to split this chapter. So this is chapter 54 in your book. Um, I'm going to cover the majority of it, except for the very end, the last part, which is disturbance and um, diversity and comp uh, composition. And I'm going to move that over to um, the next chapter in 55. The reason is, is because I don't like how the book splits some of the concepts here into two, two chapters. It doesn't follow, you know, like stream of consciousness. It's just, it just doesn't follow thought patterns very well. It just doesn't follow my understand. It doesn't track. So I'm going to try and re come figure it so it tracks a little bit better but this so uh, we're going to go over the majority of chapter 54 in your book today but um the very end i'm going to push that to the second lecture you're going to get next week well it's next week right now because it's friday today and you will get this on monday and hopefully i'll also have another lecture up as well the shorter because it will take parts of 50 chapter 54 and 55 and kind of will go and make it, you know, not as going, well, so anyway, like I said, it just didn't flow with my thoughts. So I made it try and flow with my thoughts here. So hopefully if it flows with my thoughts, it'll flow with your thoughts, I guess. I don't know. Also, you get another rant today at the end about beavers. Yeah. It's one of my favorite rants. So today we're going to talk about community ecology. So we're, we don't live in a vacuum, and no creature on this planet lives in a vacuum except for those mice utopias, and that didn't work out too well for them now, did it? So tons of po so populations of different species are often interacting with each other. Um, today we're going to explore how they interact and how this in turn affects a community structure overall and the number of species found in a community, particularly species that are present, and the relative abundance of these species. So... Interspecific interactions include competition, predation, herbivory, uh, parasitism, mutualism, and com commensalism. We're going to touch on all of these, and I'll probably have some wacky stories as I'm going along. So let's look at the three broad categories. I kind of like, I really like how your book kind of breaks it down. You got competition, where it affects both parties in the situation negatively. You got exploitation, where it affects one, one half positively and the other half negatively. And then you've got positive and yeah, interactions. I know this is symbiosis. Now, symbiosis is kind of a a funky term in, in biology because it usually means something, you know, good is happening. But in this case, I kind of put, uh, they say positive interactions. I say symbiosis and I'll get there in a bit. And that's usually, it works out perfectly for both groups or it works out great for one and doesn't really do anything to the other. It's kind of a null concept. Um, you know, they don't get anything, but they don't get hurt either. So mm, they don't care either way. So competition um, is a negative negative interaction where two uh, different species are basically competing for the same resource. And that limits the survival and the reproduction of both of these groups. And granted, this can happen in uh, the same species, which is called intraspecific competition, but we're not looking at that here. We're looking at two different species. So in 1938, there was a Russian ecologist named Gauss who basically decided to kind of put this to play in a Petri dish. So he took two closely related paramecium species um, and he basically first grew them separately and watched how they used resources and the time of which they used resources. And they used the same resources. They're, they're closely related. They use the same resources. So then he took them 
and he put them into the same habitat. He created a habitat with them with, uh, you know, very nice stable environments that kept them alive, fed them at the same time with a constant amount of food. So he never increased or decreased the food. He kept it constant. So we noticed both populations uh, rapidly increased until they hit carrying capacity, just like we were talking last lecture uh, about carrying capacity. And then they started to compete with each other. He noted that the Aurelia, the one species, outcompeted the uh, Cadantum to extinction within the habitat. And this is, be uh, this is because the Aurelia was better at using its resources. It used the resources uh, more, uh, more efficiently. And... Um, and because of that, they reproduced faster. So if you've got that edge, you're going to edge out the competition to extinction. And that became known as the competitive exclusion principle. And this pops up again and again and again um, when you're teaching, when you're talking about competition. So this is a, a major thought that if you got two uh, very similar species going for the same resources, eventually one's going to outcompete the other. It's just a matter of time. There can be only one winner. It's like the Highlander thing is there can be only one, um, which, you know, that's life. But you might be going, wait a second. If this principle is in play, how come there's so many species? Wouldn't that eliminate a lot of the species? Yeah, well, that's because life has found a way, as in the first Jurassic movie when, um, oh gosh, what's his face there? He goes, life will always find a way. Yeah, well, life has found a way to kind of move around this principle. And that's through niches. So basically there's a concept called the ecological niche. It's basically a set of biotic and abiotic resources an organism uses as an environment. And um, the competition exclusion principle states that two species using the same niche can't coexist. But what if, what if, what if one of them goes, you know what, I'm not going to compete with you. I'm going to shift in, into another niche. So that way I'm not competing with you. I'm just coexisting with you. And I'm going to use a slightly different uh, resource than you. And this happens a lot. It's called resource partitioning, where basically there's a differentiating of niches that allow the two similar species to live, uh, to coexist in a community without competing at each other because they know competing with each other is going to lead to one of their extinctions. So this is why this is actually really important. And a lot of species kind of took this. And that's actually why we get a lot of evolutionary pressure to change over time because they're competing for resources and we don't want to go extinct. So let's get into a niche. And this brings us to a fundamental niche versus a realized niche. So a fundamental niche is kind of like what we want. Um, basically it's uh, what's going on is this, this like for this type of barnacle, he can live in both uh, deep and shallow zones, intertidal zones. And he's cool with that. He's completely cool with that. So he can live in both. That's his fundamental. But what happens is a, a new guy, a new barnacle comes in and he's growing right here. And he takes up this area because he can only live in this low tide area. So that pushes the first guy up into the high tide where he can live fine, but he can't go down there because then he'll start competing with this other guy. So he just, you know, sucks it up and lives up here because he can live there. Why compete with him when he can live up here? It's like the path of least resistance. And that's called the realized niche. That's like what it is in reality. He granted he could have this whole range if it wasn't for these guys, but why compete when he can just live up here and be chill? Um, we have actually seen this in play again with the Galapagos finches, Darwin's finches. Uh, we actually saw a species move in um where there was a set of finches already living on one island and they were eating two types of seeds one that was really nutritious and one that was less nutritious but there was more of but they, the birds were primarily eating the very nutritious seeds and all, all of a sudden a new species came over and started competing and the new species started eating the very nutritious seeds but leaving the other seeds alone 
And the first species, the original species went, all right, you're stealing all those seeds, but you're not touching the other ones. So we're going to go eat those seeds. So we literally saw an entire species of finch uh, rearrange its niche just to eat, you know, the less nutritious seeds because the other guys were eating those seeds, you know, the, the, the uh, nutritious seeds, the bigger ones. And again, you saw the niche split because they knew head-on con competition was probably going to, I mean, not consciously. They're not going, oh, we will compete and I will go extinct. No, they don't do that. It's just, this is basically pressures of survival. Um, it isn't like conscious thinking. So please don't, you know, when I, I say, you know, oh, they switch because they knew they don't really know this part they just go yeah they're eating up all those seeds but they're not touching those seeds so let's just eat those seeds and thus their niche changes their niche changes so that's the difference between a fundamental and a realized niche fundamental is yeah what you can use ideally if nobody else was bothering you and it realized is oh somebody moved in i guess we've got to just do over here path of least resistance guys path of least resistance because why fight when you can just avoid? Anyway, so now competition just doesn't affect different species, but also very similar species, as well as something called character displacement. So again, we found that, again, we've been studying Galapagos finches um, because they're really good, uh, uh, nice little biomes to watch because they're little islands and the finches are always bouncing back and forth. So it's actually kind of gives us a, a real time look at what's going on here. Um, so what happens is sometimes the morphology of these species overlap, like they're going after two different, they're going after um, the different characteristics. So the different beak sizes. So what happens is, as you can see right here, the two uh, sympatric populations are hanging out And then, you know, on different islands, they're completely separated. And in this one, one island, they're together. But notice the change in the beak sizes. So what happens is on the island where they're living together, the beak changes. So that's what's showing here. When he's living alone, he's got all the resources to himself. When this one's living alone, he's got all the resources himself, no need to change. But when these two are together, What's happening is they're actually uh, driving themselves into different niches and their beak depth is changing to get certain food items. So them living together is pressuring each species to change morphology so that way they can better have a niche where they're left alone and they're not competing with their cousins, super duper cousins, like over their cousins, because they're living together and like I said, you can see where the how the numbers really overlap right here. And then it splits right here because these guys are being forced this way with a different beak size. And these guys are being this way with a different beak size. So you can numerically on a graph actually see them starting to split into separate niches. And it's driving a change in the species to becoming completely separated species. So it's kind of interesting how it's driven there. So that's called character displacement. So that's actually, long run, it's almost how wolves got turned into dolphins. Yeah, they're actually distantly related. Now keep in mind, this is distantly related, but we have dolphin skulls going back. And the further you go back with dolphins and their uh, ancestor skulls, the more it starts turning into something that looks like a wolf. So what we think is they possibly kept getting pushed, 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 pushed into the ocean until they just said, screw it, we're going back in full time. And um, we're not coming back out again. So it's interesting. I should get that image of dolphin skulls and slap that in these notes. I might do that before I pop this up so you can look at that. So anyway, now this brings us to our second interaction. So that was a... Uh, yeah, we were talking about, do, 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 you know, competition, negative, negative. So this is uh, exploitation. Now, exploitation is where one species benefits from the feeding or harming of another species. And there's three flavors of this, predation, herbivory, and parasitism. I don't know why they stuck mutualism in here. I should just do this like this, because that's not, he, 
he's somewhere else. Ignore that. I don't know why this picture had it. But anyway, so uh, of course, predation or carnivory, depending on how you want to say that. Uh, basically, it's, you know, everybody's kind of generally familiar with this, you know, lion eat antelope, uh, you know, fox eat rabbit. Stuff like that. I mean, it even happens on the cellular level. Um, so, you know, we think of bigger ones watching nature shows, stuff like that. So basically, you know, the interaction is where one species, the predator, kills and eats the other, which is the prey. Now, this interaction has driven a whole plethora of adaptations on both sides to make the predators the best that they could possibly be which is actually where we get a lot of our cats our cats are actually almost one of the apex predators because they're just so specialized and unfortunately in some cases they're over specialized almost into extinction and that's a whole nother argument right there like cheetahs um but anyway um however prey i also have up their game too it's kind of become a basically an arms race uh between prey and predator you know you know it's like you know one got fat the prey got fast so the predator got faster you know to catch it you know like you know cheetah versus antelope and or you know um uh also you know a lot of prey adaptations come from things like mechanical defenses which is like shells why turtles have shells or uh, spines uh like uh porcupines they can eject their quills which is never fun if you've had a poor puppy go decide to go sniff the butt of a porcupine and the porcupine's like oh no go away luckily my dog jet was too stupid for that thank god he never ran across a, a porcupine or a skunk thank you because the poor boy, he used to try and make friends with everything. He, the first time he saw deer, he was just like, oh, what is it? He got so excited. He was like, oh, I'm going to go down and say hello. I'm not kidding. They are standing right there. And I'm like, that's not a great idea. And he uh, just trotted right up, all happy, wag wagging his tail right up to this deer, hanging out in our yard, eating our pears, which is fine because they were hard as rocks. Um. And he's like, I love you. And the deer's like, oh god, dog. And it just bolts. And they just and there was a second one I didn't see too. And they just bolted into the woods and they ran away. And Jet was just like, I mean, literally, if that dog could cry, he would have. He turned to me and sulked all the way back to me, going, He didn't like me. And I'm like, oh my god, Jet. He didn't have a predatory bone in his body, unless it was a hot dog. And he didn't hail it. Anyway, I love my dog, but he was just not shallow into the gene pool, really, very much, definitely. Anyway, good dog, but dumb as a brick. Anyway, so, you know, uh, chemical defenses, skunks. The first one I think of is skunks. Also, urine. Uh, I know I'm not wearing Monty today. I'm sorry about that. He's eating, so I'm letting him eat. Um, but snakes, a lot of snakes, if you spook the snot out of them, especially around here, instead of biting, they'll pee all over you. Um, and that urine actually smells a lot like skunk because uh, that's what that's one of their defense mechanisms. It's like, don't eat me, and they urinate all over you. And it smells, it smells, it smells. I've been scared. I've been skunked by a snake several times. Uh, musk, again, poison, uh, stings, you know, from, you know, don't eat the wrong thing. We'll get into that in a minute. Uh, camouflage, which is aposematic and cryptic and mimicry, which is weird. There's three flavors of mimicry. Your book only goes over two for some reason, and I'm not sure why. It leaves the third one out. Of course, the third one's a really weirdo. We'll get into that in a minute. So talk about basically aposematic versus cryptic coloration. So what's going on with here is basically aposematic uh, coloration is like psychotically bright, crazy colors. So that way you're looking at the predator knows you're there. But you're you're screaming with like the wild colors, those beautiful frogs, because they're the poison dart frogs. Yeah, that's the reason they're screaming with all those colors is because it's like, notice me, but I'm poisonous. Don't eat me or you'll die too. 
and uh or you'll get so sick you throw up in this case it's you know because they want you to learn um so yeah if an animal eats him he'll either die or get really really sick and remember oh i better not eat those uh like monarchs versus victorian butterflies is another example of this um actually it's more of an example of bastian mimicry we'll get there in a minute um but anyway and then there's cryptic coloration or, or uh, this one right here basically where they blend in which you know a lot of people love posting pictures on facebook and whatnot going can you find the owl and it's like right there but it's against that because it's camouflage is just perfect um it's funny because you know we mimic nature so much but there's actually a different type of uh camouflage that we tried to use on the ocean at first we tried to use like cryptic coloration and blend um ships in with the ocean during wartime like world war one world war two and then we decided and then we consulted this is crazy a um um a magician actually we consulted a magician several different times both the british and the americans in both world wars and that was to come up with different types of it's called the dazzle uh let me find it dazzle ship dazzle ships yeah so dazzle ships it's so basically this is uh, like i said this is not found in nature so well actually it kind of is with zebras so we kind of picked up the uh idea again kind of this is not this is just being weird but it was black and white and weird all over and the idea was like if you're moving in a convoy or even if it was alone the, the lines and the stripes going every which way if you're trying to like come up in a uh, u-boat you know a, a submarine and try to pick off these ships uh, remember back then we didn't have a lot of computers you know figuring all this stuff out unlike today it was somebody you know there was a gunner looking around the periscope going all right i think he's here here's the map well with these lines going every freaking which way it was kind of the old razzle dazzle that's where the name came from so that way it, it looked like they were farther away than they really are it messed with our eyes again we actually like i said magicians kind of came up helped us come up with this so we used to use the dazzle camouflage which is kind of almost what you know uh zebra do zebra do because it's hard for you know they're black and white and they're always shifting in a huge herd it's kind of that level of uh stuff but yeah dazzle it's really interesting uh dazzle camouflage it, it's to mess with the perception of somebody trying to get to the see the boat like right here here's a uh, how dazzle camouflage kept it people safe in world war one Like, here's the Dazzle ship. When you can't really distinguish which part is which from far away, but, you know, regular like, if it was painted normal like, you can see right here is the, uh, you know, an an antennas, here's the funnel, here's the front, here's the back. With the, the Dazzle, it's it, it kind of <clears throat> makes your eyes go up, and you can't really sit there and get a good beat on the uh, ship. Pretty wacky, huh? Can I move this? Yeah, okay. Sorry, I'm moving the thing out of the way so that way i can get back here so anyway so that's the dazzle like i said um i don't know what that's called other than i just know it from world war one we did use it in world war ii for a little bit except we kind of zeroed in on it a bit more now bastian mimicry this is where a harmless species mimics a harmful one so like for instance uh monarch butterflies versus victorian butterflies victorian butterflies taste really really good to birds however uh monarch butterflies will make birds vomit and get sick so therefore they uh birds learn real fast not to eat monarchs and stay away from monarch butterflies but victorians try to look like uh, monarchs so that way they can be tricked into oh don't eat me don't eat me and that's leads us so again here's another one with the hawk moth lava where he puffs up his rear end and makes a hissing now noise out of it it's not a fart it's just weird but it looks like the head of a venomous green parrot snake so therefore or it looks like a snake so that way the bird goes oh my god it's a snake not a delicious larva so 
you, you see this over and over again like the fish they have like fake eyes on the back that so that way they look like you know they're they're scary at one direction and normal on the other direction now there's mullerian uh, mimicry which is basically two species that basically both of them are poisonous mimic each other like both this is why a lot of yellow jackets and wasps and everything have the same coloration it's not because like one's safe there is a couple of bastian mimicries up in this group but that's if you've ever wondered why wasps and bees have the same uh banding of the yellow and black that's a universal warning of stay away from us we're gonna sting your butt and other places as well especially yellow jackets because they're jerks i'm sorry it's just hornets hornets you can reason with yellow jackets there is no reasoning with those psychos you just take them out because they'll take you out they don't care they're, they're psychos i'm sorry i have a better relationship with hornets than i ever will with yellow jackets they're just evil wasps so most wasps are kind of like again they're wasps bees and hornets it's like some of them most of them especially around here you can just especially our hornets around here they're they're like duh, duh, duh. i've had them come land on me make sure i'm not a flower and then leave as long as you're not freaking out, they won't freak out, except for yellow jackets. They don't care. They're such jerks. Such jerks. Now, the third type your book doesn't really mention, and it kind of mystifies me why. And this is, and I'm going to butcher this name, so I'm sorry ahead of time, is Emsilian or Mertensian or Mertensian? Mertensian mimicry. We're a deadly snake or a deadly creature mimics a safe creature why because <sighs> because i don't know I, I well it's kind of a backwards logic it's it's kind of like oh i look like him so yeah it's kind of, it's a reverse it's kind of a newer uh newer it's kind of like reversing bastian mimicry but it's a reverse because we found out that the uh non-venomous uh snakes with these colorations actually came before these guys and these guys started mimicking them which is really weird but it also brings up the you know remember our our things because we do have uh some of these guys are sometimes on our coast they're not anywhere here in the mountains you won't see these guys they're coastal only but you know uh king snakes are all over the freaking place so it's interesting so remember red on black friend of jack red on yellow kill a fellow and it works because yeah so these guys do exist here in north carolina but out on the coast just remember the little rhyme and you're all good and most of the time these guys don't really want to bite you anyway they're just like oh goodbye so luckily they're that's why you don't hear too many things about the coral snake because usually the coral snake is just like i'm out and he doesn't really want to bite you he just wants to leave so yeah that's a, this is a newer version of kind of reversing this one and it's a weird concept i'm not entirely sure if i have my head around it correctly um anyway so anyway, so herbivory is basically the explorative, uh, explorative interaction between an organism, a herbivore, eating parts of a plant or algae and thereby harming it, but usually not killing it unless you're in Australia where the cows eat snakes, apparently. Actually, I've heard of uh, cows, but that's also how we got, you know, uh, carnivore. Uh, yeah, I've heard about, yeah, these guys. But unfortunately, uh, this is also how we got mad cow disease. It was a Puron disease. What happened was, uh, if you remember the whole mad cow or remember somebody talking about it, what happened is in Britain, they were feeding, uh, if their cow died for whatever reason, they chop it up and stick it in the feed. You know, really blend it up. So they were feeding cow to cow, which was not smart we do weird things too by putting strange things in feed there was one time we had like a way over abundance of too much candy that wasn't selling so we shipped it all out to cow farms and they put it in the feed we put weird things in cow feed to get you know more production either meat or milk out of them it's interesting um but anyway britain found the hard way that yeah maybe we shouldn't feed cows to cows because it makes a prion and remember i talked about prions back in the uh the virus one he's kind of like a protovirus 
And um, it was the cow DNA getting into and uh, driving the cows mad, literally. Um, because the prions, remember, they go up and they affect the brain. We found that out when cannibalism with humans, they were eating the brains of their ancestors and they were getting prion diseases, going crazy and dying. Same thing here. That's what mad cow was. It's don't feed cows cows. Okay. Cow eat grass. Yes. Actually, cow eat feet. Because grass is actually sort of nutritious, but not entirely. Anyway, depends on the grass. So, uh, and again, this has become an arms race because, you know, plants can't get up and leave like some creatures can. You know, most of them are planted because they're plants. So they've had to figure out ways to get animals to stop eating them too. So they use all sorts of crazy things like thorns, um, tough, tough bark-like cuticles, uh, poisons, which has backfired in a couple of plants because of us silly humans. Like, for instance, the pepper plant. I talked about that earlier, how we love the capsaicin, even though the plant's like, uh, you're not supposed to eat us because of the capsaicin. And we're just like, uh, I can take it. And then somebody's on TikTok crying. Um, and also tobacco plants with nicotine. Nicotine in its liquid form will kill you. But we smoke it. We're crazy. Yeah, that's why I always be careful of the pods because that's nicotine if you smoke the one with nicotine in it. Some people just do the flavors. Fine by me. I don't care. But uh, the nicotine, watch out. Um, that liquid in there can kill you. So yeah, a small uh, part of liquid nicotine, kill you. It came so, and the, because tobacco plants were like, yeah, don't stop. Stop eating me. And then, and then we we're like, whoa, why are you smoking me? Oh my God. Um, now, angiosperms, on the other hand, decided to take that. Remember, I said the plant kingdom is our lord and master, whether we like it or not. <laughs> well, maybe no. Yeah. You know, there are our overlords of plantiness. Anyway, and that's one of the reasons angiosperms said, if you can't beat them, use them. So what they did is, remember, fruits technically should be feeding the seed. That's what it's filled of all those nutrients and delicious things. Not so much for us, but most fruits should just drop. And then the fruit rots around the seed and the seed can absorb all of that nutrients from the fruit and grow again. That's technically what fruit started as, a way to feed the seed. However, some angiosperms said, stop eating my fruits, stop eating my fruits. Wait a second. What if I made my seeds inside the fruits resistant to your digestive juices? And then when the animal goes to the bathroom, the seeds come out into the poop and they already get a whole pile of fertilization with them. Win-win. It also brings it away from me so I can spread out my species. So some angiosperms, like apples, have been using us for generations because apple seeds actually go through our digestive system and come out with our feces and they get fertilization. So Johnny Appleseed indeed. So some angiosperms, like I said, are using us. They're using us. Of course, we're also using them. So it's, a, yeah. So, yeah. So there's there's ways plants try to get people to stop. And there's plants that are just are like, I give up. And then there's plants that increase their productivity like grass. That's why grass grows back constantly so fast because, you know, all the herbivores are mowing it down for you. Um, So they're just like, Neh, and they just grow fast. So. That's why we have to mow our lawns all the time. Unless you're one of those people that don't. Anyway, so last exploitative interaction is uh, we've talked about this on and off, on and off, on and off, and that's the parasite. Because um, I know I told you about the uh, Victorian era of eating uh, yeah, tapeworm pills with tapeworm eggs in it. I don't know. Ugh. Anyway, so it derives nourishment from another organism, its host, which is harmed in the process. So parasites that live in the body of the host are known as endoparasites, like tapeworms and pinworms and xenomorphs from the movie Aliens, as you can see right here. Now, parasites that feed on the external surface of a host are called ectoparasites. Remember, endo means inner, ecto means outer. So ectoparasites are like ticks and lice and scabies and everything else we don't like oh by the way this thing over here this is an uh endoparasite that actually it's uh gets into uh slugs and turns uh, turns them into zombies 
So <laughs> somebody put this up and I was like, I had to put this one in. I love this little cartoon. Anyway. Now, uh, populations of predators and prey in a community are not consistent. Um, they actually cycle with each other and they kind of cycle a little bit offset. So you're going to see this as a predator prey dynamics, uh, the cycling of the lynx and the snowshoe hare. And sensibly, especially we've been trapping these guys for over 200 years. So it's some of the best long range data we've got because we've been trapping them since we us pasty people came over from pasty land, which is Europe and landed here and confused the natives with all our stupidness. So anyway, so the cycle of the predator and prey lacks presently 10 years with the predator population lagging, lagging one to two years behind the prey population. So in other words, when you see the hair numbers increase, you will see a couple of years after that, or so you see this increase, you will see the lynx population increase in answer. But then the lynx will actually outcompete, you know, their own selves um, and more and more hares die and then all of a sudden the lynx drops off the, the hares will drop off the lynx population drops off and then there's not as many lynx and because there's not as many lynx the hare population will spike and because sorry that scared me for some reason and because that spikes uh then the lynx population after a couple of years rebounds but then again they eat gobble up all the hares and then the hare population dumps and over and over and over it goes. See how that works? So that's why a lot of uh, prey pop, uh, prey predator populations cycle back and forth, back and forth like that, depending on how they're preying and predating on each other. So yeah, when the lynx population is low, the hare population goes up because there's not as many hunting them down. So they have more babies. And then when that increases, the uh, pred uh, predation will rise up and then they'll eat too many of them and then the prey will numbers will drop and the link and the predator numbers will drop a couple of years after that because there's too many of them and then the cycle repeats so that's what's going on with predator prey dynamics which i'm weirded out that your book didn't mention this but anyway anyway so let's talk about positive interactions or symbiotic relationships or symbioses um now, keep in mind, uh, there are some biologists or ecologists that only see mutualism as a true symbiotic. Uh, commensalism is another thing. So sometimes symbiotic and mutualism is very much, very much joined. But in some cases, symbiotic relationships are both of these. Basically, it's where two species get to either for their benefit, uh, their mutual benefit, or they get together and one, you know, just kind of lives off the other one, but it doesn't really do anything to hurt the other one. So, you know, the ultimate bum. So anyway, there's mutualism, interaction, uh, benefits both species, like termites and the bacteria that live in their gut. So the, back, the termites eat all the, uh, you know, wood, but they can't digest that cellulose because it's rough stuff. We can't digest cellulose. So... The bacteria inside loves eating the, the cellulose that the termites ingested and basically uh, gives the termites a cut of all the energy it's getting out and, you know, gets all the food and protection of living in a termite. Um, same thing with, uh, we talked about this back in the plant kingdom and the fungi kingdom where the fungi and the plant roots will have a, a mutualistic benefit where they basically, you know, the fungi can decompose around it and suck up all the nutrients that the plant can't get in its roots. And then they, you know, he gives all those minerals and whatnot to the plant and the plant gives back all the, all the uh, sugar that he's been making. And the two of them are happy, slappy mutualism. So we have that too. We have gut the uh, you know, bacteria that lives in our gut, which is why, you know, antibiotics is we, we try to use that as sparingly as possible because we'd also, you know, A, we don't want uh, bacteria to butate against these things and number two we don't want to kill off all of our good bacteria that lives in our gut or else we're going to have diarrhea city so so we have it too now there's communalism which is basically interaction that benefits one species but not the other but it also doesn't hurt them so cattle egrets and water buffalo so cattle egrets come down and pick bugs off the water buffalo now were the bugs bothering the water buffalo no but um, 
doesn't hurt the water buffalo so they just stand there with with bird on their rear end mm. also sharks and remoras uh remoras oh there's fish that have the, like the sucker they attach to the bottom of sharks and what happens is they hitch a ride on the shark and when the shark feeds they make a mess if you haven't ever seen shark feeds uh they're like uh, uh, and like there's little bits and pieces going everywhere where the remoras will detach them and then go out and eat up all the scraps that the uh, from the sharks eating and then they'll reattach to another shark and go swimming off so the sharks ignore the remoras the remoras aren't doing anything the remoras aren't really interesting to them because they just got they just ate so they don't really care about the remoras and they don't eat the remoras but, you know, the Remoras just hang on for the ride, get to eat the scraps, and then hang on for another ride. So that's basically sharks and Remoras. They're, eh. All right. Diversity. So species diversity of a community is basically there's, uh, you know, different kinds of organisms in different types of communities um the basically remember when we were talking about all the different biomes the one with the highest species diversity is always the um rainforest they've got good luck eh, lots um but there's always two components to this if you're trying to measure species diversity there's species richness which is the number of different species in the community and relative abundance or basically how many of those species are in that community so you know yeah got the wrong thing on the thing but anyway so ecologists use many tools to compare these i mean like i found a list of all the different math things and one of the, your book mentions the shannon diversity index which is basically right here which is basically h in parentheses equals uh now they show it in a different way remember this e means it just keeps going and going so the p is the proportion of the population the n is a particular species found in the population uh ln here is a natural uh, logarithm and this is the sum of it and s is all the species so your book explains it pretty well um but i'm not going to bash your head in with that like i said the shannon diversity index is just one of many and i should have put the whole list here just to make you go oh god so yeah math comes in again here comes math da, da, da. anyway so i'm leaving that and moving on with this so biomass is the total mass of all the living things in a given area this can also refer to the mass of a particular type of matter such as organic materials used to produce biofuels <clears throat> oil uh, biomass is generally used, uh, measured in uh, grams per meter squared or kilograms per meter squared. The rate at which photosynthetic primary producers incorporate energy for the sun is the gross primary productivity. Because remember, I, when I mentioned in the intro to ecology lecture, we talked about how the sun is basically what drives all the trophic levels of organisms in a community. We get all our energy bioenergy from the sun because you know plants take plants and algae take the sun turn it into basically you know take the sun take water take carbon dioxide slap together give us oxygen and sugar and then herbivores come over and digest those sugars and then predators come over and digest those herbivores to get those sugars and then energy is lost on the way up which is this is where it drives me nuts. this is the perfect place to talk about energy loss between the levels and your book saves it for the next chapter. And I don't like that split, but that's just me. That's just a personal thing because this is the perfect place to talk about energy levels. But what do I know? How beavers in the... Uh, I've got a beaver rant. Yeah, <laughs> I do know that. Anyway, so within an organism's niche, the organism interacts with the ecosystem by attaining food from the ecosystem and contributing energy to the ecosystem. Now, Again, this is kind of a reminder from the beginning. So a food web is a food chain that has many, many overlaps. Remember, basic food chain consists of the sun, which is used by a producer, which is then eaten by a first level consumer, which is then eaten by a second level consumer. 
and then finally dies and decays and is returned to the soil by a uh, decomposer. You know, you know, he was in the Lion King, the great circle of life, blah, blah, blah. But each level of this, the position an organism occupies in a food chain is called its tropic level. Now, interestingly enough, what keeps this short is basically energy transmission. Again, why your book missed this opportunity and stuck it in the next chapter, I'm not entirely sure. But I'm going to respect its wishes and talk about it in the next lecture, which I should record on Monday, hopefully. Anyway, so anyway, so the position occupies its trophic level. So most of all the energy is available in the producer level. So a lot of it's sitting here and it kind of dilutes as it goes down, which leads to some controls depending on the species and which is going to bring me to my rant. All right, so there's two overall flavors of species that can run a community. And I don't mean like, you know, they're elected collectors or anything like that. No, there's, there's, so there's two flavors of this. There's the keystone species, which exert strong control on a community by their ecological roles or niches. So in other words, you know, these guys have a massive impact on the ecosystem that if they're removed, the ecosystem would dramatically change. Like we're actually seeing it in a minute. And I'm going to explain that in a moment. So if these guys are removed in any form or way, the drastic shift in population, is going to completely throw that ecosystem into an absolute tizzy. And you're actually seeing that. So here's some examples like wolves, gray wolves. Um, right now we see that that's how we, why we hunt deer other than, you know, people like to hunt which is fine but the reason we uh we have to regardless control the population of deer because without a predator it explodes is because we took out the gray wolves in our forests around here because us and the gray wolves yeah we didn't we, we didn't compete very well did we we kind of yeah said no get out of here um uh elephants mangrove trees in swamps Beavers, <laughs> I'm going to come back to him. Sharks, uh, sanguaro cactus, grizzly bears, sea otters, bees. Again, this is why we're all freaking out about, oh no, the bees, oh no, the bees. Because without pollinators, we lose the majority of our crops. And that's not awesome. That's actually horrifying. So anyway, sharks actually is interesting because we see this um, right happening right now off the coast of South Africa. Um, what's happening is, uh, if you want to go, you know, play with great whites, like, you know, when discovery does shark week, they're always going to South Africa. Cause that's a really huge population on the cliffs there of, um, sea lions. And so there's tons of sea lions. And when the sea lions have to go in and swim and come out, you know, they get gobbled up by, uh, great whites because great whites hang out there. Now there is one predator of the great white, and I don't mean man. And I actually mean the killer whale. Orca, which blew our minds when we figured this out, kill sharks. Sometimes for fun, just because they didn't like them that day. We didn't know that for years until we had a whale watching boat. And this actually happened um, off the coast of California. I almost want to say in the bay? you know, Golden Gate, you know, uh, Cal uh, the, 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 the San Francisco Bay. I want to say there, but I'm not positive. So don't quote me on that. So what happened is there was a whale watching crew. Uh, you know, they do them all the time. You just get on a boat, you go out, they bring you where they think whales are going to be that day. And you hang out and stare at the whales and you go, ooh, and ah. And um, this, this particular was going out and watching uh, killer whales or orca. And um, it was weird because uh, the captain of the, the vessel saw them, but they also saw somebody scream shark and they saw a great white fin. And the guy said, oh, that's so weird. Why are there orca and a great white? And he got on the radio because he was a friend with uh, whale biologists uh, back at uh, on the land. And he said, guys, something weird's happening between a, a school of, uh, you know, a pod of orca. Was, their family units are called pods, my bad and a great white, you might want to get out here. And so, uh, yeah, they hopped on their boat saying, oh, that sounds weird. So they they come out and they came out just in time to watch the orca pod start swimming around and around and around the great white and completely disorienting it. And then they ripped it to shreds and it was recorded every which way. I mean, they ripped it to shreds. 
Um, and there are uh, pods up and down the uh, uh, the Pacific coast that just eat great whites. So thank you, Orca, for eating the great whites. But now, unfortunately, it's been being passed on because Orca talk to each other. Um, Orca also do weird things like, it, God, if they if they have their own version of TikTok, I swear, because there was Orca out in the Atlantic that decided it was really funny to wear dead fish on their heads as hats. And then one pod started it and biologists noticed and said, that's so silly. That's so weird. Why are they doing that? And then all of a sudden, another pod, you know, few miles away started doing it too and then all of a sudden everybody on the european coast started wearing uh dead fish on their heads it was like the trend of the time so these guys are insanely intelligent and they don't mind ripping up a great white and unfortunately getting back to south africa what happened this keystone species got removed by orca a pot of orca boy orcas came in to the area where great whites are normally, you know, the keystone species, came in, started eating up all and tearing apart all the great whites and just taking over the area. So the great whites scattered. You think they're going to hang out when there's a bunch of orca ripping them up just for giggles? Oh, heck no. They're not going to stick around. So the whole ecosystem off the coast of South Africa has changed drastically because sharks are gone. The orca are in, and now the population of um, of those uh, seals are exploding. So there's been a whole ecosystem shift that had nothing to do with humans for once. Um, so oh. now foundation species are also known as ecosystem engineers because these guys uh, cause huge changes um, and affect community structure. For instance, beavers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get here. You're going to love this story. So beaver dams uh, can transform landscapes on a very large scale. Actually, they do it constantly and we're always going, stop it, but they don't, they don't care. Um, them building dams and their homes are just, it's, and some of the, it's just what they do. But because of this, they're a foundation species. They literally can change the whole aspect. They can dam up and turn, you know, uh, a stream into a swamp. And that changes the ecosystem big time. Um, also around, um, uh, they can change, um, uh, one part, they dammed up one area. Um, there was a stream on, on upside of the mountains around here. They dammed it up and it, the water eroded into, uh, a part that we were holding back. So there wouldn't be rock slides caused a whole freaking rock slide and, you know, took out a portion of the highway up in Forsyth. I want to say Forsyth, but that's probably not right. Starts on F. Anyway, so beavers have, are known to do huge ecological changes, which is why they're called a foundation species. So they act, uh, some foundation species act as facilitators and have positive effects as survival and reproduction of some other species in the community. So getting to my rant. All right, here's today's rant. Are we ready? All right. So once upon a time, back in the 1950s, Oh, yeah, the 1950s when, you know, science was, and nobody stopped the question. We decided to build the parkway, which, you know, in and of itself wasn't a bad thing. Everybody had cars, you know, the suburbia, and everybody wanted to drive their cars every which way, you know, Route 66 stuff. Well, here in North Carolina, South Carolina, you know, parts of South Carolina and Georgia, we sat there and said, you know what? We have all these beautiful, fancy cars. It's a shame we can't drive these gas guzzlers up into the mountains. So by golly, we're going to build a special road where you can go up and drive your gas guzzlers up and down in the pretty, pretty mountains. And so you can see nature up close and personal in your car. Hey, what was a, you know, actually, you know, like I said, I like the parkway, so it's, it's cool. But anyway. So unfortunately, though, when we were building it, we decided to fix, fix all the rivers and streams around the parkway because we were like, God, they're all wiggly and all over the place. And I'm, I'm sick of building bridges over every single piece of, you know, waterway up here in the mountains when we were when they were building the parkway. So they decided in their infinite wisdom to straighten the streams 
So it would match prettily with the parkway. Guys, streams and rivers are wiggly for a reason. They have, you know, their shapes for a reason. It drives the ecology and the ecosystem of those streams and rivers, especially the insects. So after they got done building and drove their shiny cars up and down, the, you know, the uh, parkway, looking at the pretty, pretty nature that they've screwed up, they didn't realize that by straightening the streams, that they have destroyed diversity in those streams. So they had destroyed the diversity. So there wasn't any place for, because you know, all those bends and everything that make those, those perfect places where the, you know, the, the water slows down. It's a perfect place for like fish to hatch eggs. It's a perfect place for in water insects to hatch their eggs. So that way you have the water insects. So they hatch. So that way that feeds the fish and all sorts of other things too. So without, you know, the stream being suddenly uniform and where there's no, you know, flow or it's slower so that way creatures can deposit their eggs and not worry about them going downstream. Um, yeah, all of a sudden diversity went. And then the fishermen, because you get to drive your nice shiny big car and then go fishing in the mountains, suddenly we're complaining, where are our brown trout? The trout are gone. Why are the trout gone? So 60s, 70s, 80s. Yeah, how come our stream diversity is destroyed? Where did all the brown trout go? Oh, who who cares? Let's restock with rainbow trout, the northern invader. Yeah, there's there's three flavors of trout in this area. And, and um, the only one that's native is the brown trout. The other two trout, which is the brook trout and the rainbow trout, are, are considered northern invaders because they're northern species. They were not found here nor naturally in um, North Carolina. Only the brown trout was. So most biologists call the rainbow trout the northern invader. Um, and But people prefer to fish rainbow trout over brown trout because brown trout, well, they're brown. They're... They're not that exciting looking compared to brook trouts and uh, rainbow trouts. So that and some people say, I don't know. I've, I have never really tasted brown trout. But then again, I'm not a fan of trout. So hmm. I did tag them. That's why I know all the tag things. Um, so, yeah. Um, so straightening the streams made it so there was no fish to fish because we had killed off the insect population and the fish population and everybody else's populations and our beautiful clear streams were dead. So the fishermen raised a ruckus and being a major part of, you know, uh, pulling in, you know, visitors, tourists to our beautiful mountains. In the 90s, when I started going to college, they said, oh, we should fix that. So the ends, uh, so the state turned around and tasked the uh, North Carolina uh, Department of Transportation to fix the streams and put the wiggles back in. They get paid if they put the wiggles back in. However, there was somebody else that was beating them to the punch and fixing the streams naturally. And that was beavers. So beavers were beating them to it. And if a beaver fixed the stream by building dams and that actually makes the stream come out of the stream bed and it gets the wiggles back in naturally, guess what? They didn't get paid. So... <laughs> When I was going to college, we had North Carolina DOT people keep coming into Western Carolina University going, yeah, how do you get rid of beavers without killing the beavers? And we were like, uh, <laughs> because North Carolina uh, government told them, yeah, OK, well, you're not if the beavers do it, then you don't get paid for the work. And number two, because the beavers beat you to it. And now there's nothing to be done. So nature took care of itself. But if you want it, you can't kill the beavers. Because they're a protected species. And the North Carolina DOT is like, well, what do you want us to do? And they're like, I don't know, you figure it out. So they were like, okay, so we'll trap them. And um, um, move them away. Except beavers aren't stupid. 
nature's engineers are not dumb and they know exactly where to go back to where they were they were like excuse you very rude how dare you trap me and move me somewhere else i had to walk you know i had to walk three days back i have short legs so anyway so yeah it was a war between the north carolina dot fixing the lakes the fixing the streams and their rivers in the mountains versus the beavers who were beating them to the punch so that is why the north carolina dot hates beavers <laughs> so there you go and there's my north carolina dot versus the beavers rant can't make this stuff up, I swear. All right, last thing I want to talk about is um, basically who controls a community. There's a uh, bottom-up control and top-down control. So bottom-up control is basically where the predators depend on prey for food and prevent, uh, prevent, pervert, what am I smoking? Uh, prevent herbivore overpopulation, which is a top-down control. So basically some of these things are kind of going back and forth here. Um, so like top-down controls, like chop, uh, tropic cascade model, it's kind of what you know. So, uh, you know, large fish eat small fish, eat zooplankton, eat phytoplankton. That would be uh, a top-down control. Because the phytoplankton, if something happened to them, it would just ruin everything that way so effects are propagated up and down the food chain as pluses or minuses and if you remove the large fish then the small fish increase the zooplankton will decrease and these guys will increase so yeah they're all kind of controlled in a way so bottom up is where resources control the community and top down is where predators control the community and if you yoink one out it's going to kind of make everybody go Wee -oo, wee -oo, like that you know you got a whole suddenly these guys aren't being so they explode in population but these guys who are being eaten dip in population and these guys now that there's not as many eating these guys these guys explode in population so that's called the trophic cascade model so bottom up resources control the community top down predators control the community and it could go back both ways so like here's a bottom up infrequent fruit limits uh herbivores and herbivore controls plant populations that's top down bottom up is if there's not enough fruit to feed these guys it limits them scarce soil nutrients limit the growth of plants so that's a bottom up control so it changes depending on what's going on in the community so the top down or bottom up kind of it on different levels it's you know going both ways so this is where i'm going to leave you for today um, I'm going to pick back up with how energy moves between the trophic levels because I'm not, like I said, I wasn't entirely sure. And then we'll jump to like the last part of the book or not the last part of the book, but yeah, basically I'm going to wrap up the last part of the chapters with this next lecture. We're going to talk about disturbance, diversity uh, that way. And then we're also going to talk about um, the cycles that are happening in the in the world so i'm gonna fix those notes up because like i said those notes are all over the place from last year so i'm gonna fix those hopefully record either monday or tuesday hopefully get it up by wednesday i'm hoping at the latest the second a second one will pop up wednesday so i'm hoping so that way the last week we can focus on just uh reviewing for the final okay all right so like so uh you know if you have any questions put it in the uh forums or email me or remind you know hit me up in the remind and with that said you have a great day and i'll talk to you in the next lecture bye